the Constitution is so cool. There's so many neat things in it, and we don't want it to be uh, misconstrued. So we're going to look at some of the facts today. I like to give you guys facts and names and times and dates, because with that, then we can, we can have a better understanding. Okay, so we're still in the final battle series today. We're going to understand a little bit about twisting the Constitution. Uh, that's what the enemy always wants to do, twist things around from the original intent so people are deceived to get people to go in the wrong direction. So I got a lot of reading I want to do today. As you can see, we got two pages of notes. I hardly ever do that. One of the reasons I gave you two pages today, um, I, I, I should be able to get through it. I'll move pretty fast. But one of the reasons why I like to do this is because um, a, a lot of times on social media, whatever you like to use, your venue for social media, um, when you, when you want to enter into a debate, when somebody says, well, it's not a Christian nation or they make um, uh, claims and things that are untrue, um, you can go to our website and um, you, can, you can get, these are posted, all of our notes are posted, so you have it electronically. So you can, you know, um, copy and paste a, a quote or a statement or a statistic, and then you can bring that and, and post it onto your social media. So when someone tries to tell you something that's not true, you can say, oh no, this is the history. This is actually what's true. And respond statistically and factually, historically correct with what the truth is. And, and that helps us, I believe, in the validity of trying to um, discuss with people about our different perspective and why we believe what we believe. It's not just, I mean, it's, it's first and foremost because the Bible, but then how does the Bible then play out with the rest of our perspective, especially our Constitution? Okay, so our Constitution is being manipulated and twisted to conform to the beliefs of of a lot of liberals. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point some of these things out today. And again, I don't, I, I, I don't mean to, to, to pick on any one particular political party. We've talked about the deep state, and the deep state is like a, a force that's behind a lot of the politicians. It's, it's like a force that um, really has directed um, this whole world trying to go into a one world order. And there are Republicans as well as Democrats Libertarians, there's a lot of uh, political parties that are involved in the deep state. But um, what I also want to do is point out when there are laws that are passed, who is the main driving force between laws that are anti word of God? If a law is anti word of God, then we need to say, wait a minute, this doesn't line up. We see things through a biblical perspective, we believe in the truth that's in Scripture. And, and if it doesn't line up with this, I'm going to speak out against it, okay? Now, you can make it a law, but that doesn't mean that I have to agree with it. I, if I have to abide by your law, for the most part, I will until it tells me to do something that drastically violates my faith. If they say I can't mention the name of Jesus Christ anymore or you'll be put in jail, well, then you better be coming for me because I'm not shutting up. I'm never going to stop <laughs> mentioning the name of Jesus Christ. So hopefully there'll be so many of us, they won't be able to put us in jail because we'll stand up for what we believe. So again, you know, it has to be done in a proper perspective. So I, I, I said that so we can understand where I'm going with this today. Now, um, one, of the, one of the things that has always uh, opposed Christianity in a, in a free republic is communism and socialism. That's a historical fact. Communism, socialism do not like Christianity. Um, unfortunately now, a lot of people in the Democratic Party are coming up with a, a new democratic socialism, and they're making laws, H.R. 5, that are contrary to the Word of God, that are tearing down and, and coming against our, our, our Word of God and our faith. They, they want to silence us. David Barton, in his book, Original Intent, very good book if you want to understand about our Constitution, he states the term revisionist, we've heard the term a revisionist, are those who distort historical facts for their own political agenda. The ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, was started by Roger Baldwin, who was an admitted communist, founded in 1917. So this battle um, uh, coming against the Word of God and manipulating our Constitution, it's been going on for 100 years, but it's just been getting very brazen and very bold lately, uh, just flat out coming against things that are, are Christian and, and really manipulating our Constitution uh, worse than we've ever seen it. But he started doing this a long time ago. In 1935, uh, with a, a communism as its goal, Baldwin started using the courts to interpret the Constitution his way to try to, to, try to get God pretty much forced out of and to give more 
uh, credence to communism and socialism. Matt Barber uh, said that the ACLU, uh, communism is its goal. And it's a really good article. I put that article there. If you want to go to that and read that, I read that. It's not that long. And it just under, it's giving you that understanding of what the ACLU is really trying to do and how they started. Our federal courts assault on Christianity. Over the past 50 years, this battle in the courts has been going on to remove the mention of God from our, our public arena. Now, it, it basically started 100 years ago, but even more so in the last 50 years. This is when they started and they removed prayer from school, okay? And, and all these things started. It, it, then it just started to just spiral out of control after that. Now, nowhere does the Constitution use... This is not in our Constitution. We hear this, this, the, the, this phrase, oh, separation of church and state. That's not even in our Constitution. But they'll use that to justify shutting us up, eliminating anything having to do with our faith from, from the law or, or, or our Constitution or anything else, which is wrong. It violates the original intent, which I'll show you today. This is what the First Amendment says. See, we get some history today. Isn't it great? You get to come here and get history lessons and civil government lessons. Our First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Okay, so there's the first part of this sentence of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So let's define it even a little more. Or prohibit the free exercise thereof. So what does this mean? What is the understanding of this? Congress is not to make a house religion. They're not to say that, okay, in America... There's only one faith and one religion, and everybody has to be Catholic. They can't do that. They can't do that. They can't make a, 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 a one religion and say everybody has to be this religion. In this, though, you're going to see how our Constitution was based. The foundation for understanding this and these beliefs are all come from a Christian biblical perspective. And we're going to show you that, how it's all woven into this. And it says, too, that the state's not to prohibit the free exercise thereof. So in other words, they can't stop us from practicing our faith. And when this was written, when it referred to religion and faith and understanding, the primary religion that they were referring to is Christianity. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll show you all that. Now the courts are on a mission to prohibit the free exercise thereof. The separation of church and state phrase, which they invoke, and which has today become so familiar, was taken from an exchange of letters between President Thomas Jefferson and the Baptist Association of Dunbarry in Connecticut shortly after Jefferson became president. And so that was written, but it, it was in response to a totally different conversation, and that was not the intent of it, was to remove God from every aspect of our government. That was not the intent, even when Jefferson wrote this about separation of church and state. It had to do, again, with the, the, the government, the federal government, saying this is going to be the, the church religion. I mean, this is going to be the state. This is what we're going to do. There's only one. That, it was to stop that. And, and, and so that's what Jefferson was afraid of. And you can, you can understand that. But then somebody else takes it and, and twists it around into separation of church and state, meaning that the church has, can't have anything to do with government and, and our laws and our regulations and our constitution and completely separate it. That's not true. Our constitution was written on biblical perspectives and woven right into our, our, our constitution, right into our government, right into our, our, our uh, political system right off the bat. It was, it was meant, Christianity was meant to be a part of our political system. And when it was created, Christianity was a part of our political system. I'm going to show you that. The Mayflower Compact, the first government document. How, now, us older people have heard of the, the Mayflower Compact. I'll bet you if you ask people under 20, unless they were homeschooled, if, if they went to, <laughs> I know, the homeschoolers know. But people from public school don't have a clue when you say May, Mayflower Compact. They don't have a clue what you're talking about. And yet, it's perhaps the most important document ever in the history of our nation. This was, the first, this was the first document ever for our, our nation. I think that would be an important document. And it's even referred to as America's birth certificate. This is how important it is. It's considered America's birth certificate. It appeared in our history book for 150 years. It was in our history classes. And then all of a sudden, now it's gone. It's not in there. They don't teach about it. Why? Because it gives reference to God. So they think because it gives reference from God, that's it. We've got to remove it. 
It's a historical document. It is what it is. It says what it says. <laughs> Just because it mentions God does not mean that you remove it. This is ridiculous. And now we don't even teach people about it. Kids, they're, they're, it, Listen, remove documents, change intent, twist the truth, change history. The 4th of July, 150 years after the ratification of the Constitution, it was considered a religious holiday. This is for 150 years, religious holiday, which Americans were to stop and thank God, specifically thank God, for our independence. Now our 13 colony, colony flag offends people, causing contempt. I mean, this is supposed to be about honoring our flag, honoring our country. Our flag is a representation of our nation. A flag is the banner that we lift up. God is all about banners. We're under the banner of God. You know, uh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, he is our banner. He is our God. We lift him up high. And the flag of the United States represents this country and the freedom which, which we believe was given to us from Jesus Christ and the understanding of biblical principles that all of us are created equal in God's eyes. And through that, a government that all of us are to be looked upon as equal in God's eyes. And so the flag is a symbol of honor. The flag is a symbol of our freedom. The flag is a symbol of this Constitution. And the flag is to be honored, especially on the 4th of July. And the original flag that was started was the 13 colony flag from Betsy Ross, who sewed that original first flag, who was against slavery, who didn't want anything, was outspoken, didn't want anything to do with slavery or anything. And so here comes a, a, a professional sports athlete that has an attitude with America and, and says that, oh, we, well, you know, uh, Colin Kaepernick, he's the, he's the guy. He says, well, this, that, that flag offends me because it has to do with a, a oppression and slavery. What? You don't even know your history. See, that shows you weren't homeschooled. God. Because it's not true. Betsy Ross was all about um, freedom, didn't, didn't want the slaves to be in, in bondage. And, 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 and he makes this statement. And so Nike had tennis shoes with the uh, Betsy Ross flag, our 13 colony flag, on the back of the tennis shoes. And then all of a sudden, since he makes this statement that it's offensive, wait, all of a sudden he has all this power and they pull it because they don't want to offend anybody. This is crazy. That's crazy logic, because it wasn't even accurate. I think that's kind of embarrassing. Amen. George Washington, one of the most famous portraits painted of George Washington are of him kneeling in prayer. You see that where you'd see his horse, and you see him kneeling in prayer next to his horse. Now, there are many written testimonies from the generals in his day, which we still have, about, about Washington's Christian faith, that he was a Christian man. Today... Historians in history calls him a deist. Now, what's, what's, what's a deist? A deist is somebody, a deist belief is that, well, there is a God, there's some kind of a supreme being out there, but we don't know much about him, and he's not a, a, someone you talk to, he's not this personal being, it's just there's this, there's this power, there's this other power out there, this other kind of, we don't know what kind of God or whatever. A deist acknowledges that kind of power, but nothing to do with a personal relationship and, and, or, or anything of that nature at all. And so then, if Washington is supposedly a deist and sees God as this foreign power that, you know, you never have nothing to do with, he just kind of, you know, does what he wants and, and, and we just live in this world. And, and if that's true, then why is one of the most um, popular pictures of him kneeling in prayer next to his horse? A deist doesn't pray. So even history and the pictures we have, this is just totally false, totally crazy statements. But again, they're trying to change history. Governor Morris wrote, penned the Constitution. He's the guy, when they did the Constitution, he's the guy who wrote it all down because they didn't have computers to print it back then, you know, so he's the guy who wrote it, all right? Now, his was the final signature on the Constitution. He was the most active member on the Constitutional, on the Constitution Convention, speaking 173 times. So when they came up with the Constitution, um, they really talked about this, they discussed this, the principles, the understanding, the intent. They wanted to make this very, very clear. He authored two works on the Constitution in which he wrote, religion is the only solid basis of good morals, therefore education should teach the precepts of religion and the duties of man toward God. So this is what, you know, here's one of the guys who he was more active than anybody in discussion. He, he, he came to the floor to present his ideas and perspective when they're talking about building the Constitution more than anybody else. I think he had a lot of input into the Constitution. 
And he wrote a couple books so we know what he said and what he believes. And he said, religion is the only solid basis of good morals. Therefore, education should teach the precepts of religion and the duties of man toward God. Uh, there is only, now, this is what we have to understand, too. You're going to see this today. There's only one religion that's compatible with the Constitution. Christianity. Why? Because it was written through the eyes of Christianity. Our Constitution and the intent was written through the understanding of the biblical principles. If you take out the biblical principles of Christianity, our Constitution falls apart. You cannot take our Constitution and, and view it through the religion of Islam. Sharia law and our Constitution are opposites. One puts you in a bondage, the other one takes them away. <laughs> Sharia law is completely different than what our Constitution is. Our Constitution only works through Christianity. Take Christianity out of it, it falls apart. There are people who just want to throw it away and start over. Our Constitution. And if they can't do that, they're revising it as revisionists who distort historical facts for their own political agenda. James Wilson was the second most active member of the uh, Constitutional Convention. He spoke on the floor 168 times. He wrote the first legal commentaries on the Constitution, and he was the first Supreme Court Justice, one of them. And he said, human law must rest its authority ultimately upon the authority of that which is divine. In other words, all of our laws have to be tied into the authority of the law which is divine. All of our laws have to be tied into the authority of Scripture. You can't separate our Constitution with biblical foundations and understandings because everything that they did was based on the divine law of Scripture. That's what he just said. Did you hear the quote? Let me read it again. Human law must rest its authority ultimately upon the authority of that law which is divine. In other words, we can't separate God's law from civil law. Apart from Christianity, our Constitution will not work. We'll lose our freedoms. Um, time clouds intent. Not, you know, this is what our forefathers wanted to do. Our forefathers wanted to make absolutely sure that we would not lose the original intent of the Constitution and how the, the, the biblical principles were woven into this. And so we see this in everything we do. All of Washington, when it was built, the, the, the monuments, um, the different areas, um, the Supreme Court, all these things have um, scriptures um, uh, in stone, have um, the Ten Commandments, on, uh, different things woven in the doors, uh, Moses, um, uh, so many things that are, are, are up there. Um, that are symbolic of our Christian faith woven right into the Capitol. Um, and many times they've been wanting to refurbish the Capitol. And I just wonder if they ever get permission to do that. I wonder how it's going to look when they're done refurbishing. But cloud, uh, time clouds and tent is a ploy used by people who want to change the meaning of our Constitution. But you can go into a regular public library, this is a typical public library, find 97 volumes of personal writings from George Washington. 18 from James Madison, 33 from John Adams, 23 from John Quincy Adams. This is, you know, what this person found when they went into just a typical library. The list goes on and on. Our founding fathers wrote extensively so we would know their exact intent for all of history. Our founding fathers wanted to make sure what they were going to die for, what they're willing to lay their lives down and die for, they're doing it because they want their kids and grandkids and grandkids and grandkids, they want a generation after generation to have no doubt what's the original intent of the Constitution so people didn't distort it because they know what the habits of men are is to come in and distort and twist and get greedy and want to rule and want to be corrupt and control people. And they said... We're going to make it perfectly clear. We're going to write hundreds of documents. We're going to write all kinds of books so everybody will know what our original intent is. And they're out there. But despite that, people will twist the truth. And this is why. This is how they do it. There's something out there, uh, and it's, it's a way of thinking, and it's called postmodernism. Postmodernism, what this believes is there, there are no absolute truths. There's no absolute truth. And everything is subjective. Truth is subjective. Because what might be truth to you might not be truth to me. That's what postmodernism says. 
That is woven into our schools. Um, Frederick Nietzsche is the guy, he's the father of this postmodernism. And his understanding of everything being relevant and truth being relevant, it's all subjective, um, that just flies right in the face of, of Scripture. Um, what this does is it, it almost eliminates logic based on truth. Because if truth is whatever you want it, then trying to discuss something logically is almost impossible. So in other words, even though this happened, and, and you saw this, and you think, well, this is what happened, I can say, oh, no, 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 no. Let me really tell you what happened in the truth in that. Manipulate the intent, manipulate everything, and get you to believe something happened completely different than what actually happened, because truth is relevant after all. When I was in college to go to school as a teacher and ha got my degree in education, Frederick Nietzsche was one of the guys that we studied the philosophy from, about postmodernism, about everything being relevant and had to take this into our education system when we tried to teach people that everybody's going to see things and, 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 and it's fine and that there's no absolute truth. It's like, wait a minute, if there's no absolute truth, forget it. There's nothing to stand on. There's no foundation for our logic. And this is why people can make crazy claims. Did you ever hear some of the things that some people believe in, especially, and, and, and again, a lot of the left, they really strongly embrace postmodernism. You know, that has ties into Luciferian and all that good stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's a demonic, it, what, what postmodernism is, it's a spirit of deception. It's a spirit of deception. Because if I can get you to see things through that, then you're going to be easily deceived. Absolute truth is the Word of God. This is an absolute truth. And if you see things through this, you won't be deceived. But that's why they, they, they want to remove this, remove the Word of God, remove Scripture, then people can be much more easily deceived. The L.A. Times, the L.A. Times, um, reporter Stephen Morris, uh, Morris wrote an article titled, The Founding Fathers Were Not Christian. He claims they were deists, atheists, agnostic, and the Constitution reflects that, which is a complete lie. Colleges teach that none of our founding fathers were Christian. None. There are some colleges that teach not one of our founding fathers were Christian. That's a flat-out lie. The book Grave Influence, this is a really good book. I like to quote some of these books in here. Um, very good. Um, I really recommend that by Brennan House. He explains in great detail how communistic professors, back in the 60s when we started going crazy, intentionally with drugs and sex and rock and roll, whoo, the unholy trinity, they intentionally went into our colleges to subvert our republic and attack Christianity and push a communistic agenda. Because if you can get the young people to see it and embrace it, especially the ones going to college who are going to be your professors and your scientists and your legal people and your lawyers and your politicians, if you can get them to embrace an understanding of, of a communistic and of a postmodern understanding, then they're going to change the, the world into an understanding of postmodernism, which is anti-Christian, and that's what you see happening. Frederick Nietzsche has greatly influenced our education, like we said, postmodernism. Frederick uh, Nietzsche also said, God is dead. You heard that popular phrase, God is dead. Well, that came from Nietzsche. And he hated Christians. You know, that, that movie, anybody see the movie, God is Dead? You know, a pretty cool movie. Where it took place in a college. God's not dead? God's not dead? I mean, God's not dead, right. God, God is dead. God is not dead. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A little help from my friends all the time. We need each other. Okay, now I'm going to get through this last page in five minutes. Can I get an Amen. Okay. Now, signers of the Declaration of Independence, just so you can understand this, here's the facts. Okay? 56 people who signed it, right? 27 had seminary degrees. All were Christians but Jefferson and Franklin. They founded over 121 different Bible societies, of which some still exist today, such as the American Bible Society. Started way back then. Francis Scott Keyes was the first president of the American Sunday School Union for 52 years, and he penned our Star Spangled Banner. We've all heard of that. The list goes on and on. The Declaration of Independence was written with total dependence on God, knowing they could all be put to death. Listen, this is so fascinating. Think of this. When they, when they signed the Declaration of Independence, when they said, okay, King of England, we're no longer going to be underneath you, they knew the king was going to say, tyranny! Penalty for ty tyranny? Kill them! Death. 
They knew they were signing their death warrants when they signed the Declaration of Independence. They felt, if we make it alive out of this, that's good. If we make it alive out of this and we still have some stuff, that's even better. They had no army, they had no navy, no military, and were coming against the most powerful military in the world, Great Britain. This is what they did. They got together when they signed this and they said, we're going to, to one another, all 56 of those men, they said, to one another, we pledge our life, our possessions, and our loyalty. And I heard, I, I, I saw some information on the prices they paid. Many of the ones who signed it, they were, they were wealthy. They had good businesses. They didn't need to do this. They were doing well. They were living comfortably. And they knew when we did this, this is going to jeopardize our kids. This is going to jeopardize our grandkids because of looting and war and what could happen. Many of them lost their fortunes. They lost everything they had. Many of them lost their lives. I mean, come on, their army was farmers with pitchforks. <laughs> they got some muskets. They got some things. They got some people prepared. And a lot of them sold out their business and almost all their wealth to get weapons. They sold what they had. And they pledged their possessions, everything they had, and they pledged their loyalty to one another. The first official meeting of Congress, September 7th, 1774, opened with a three-hour prayer. So wait, if the original intent was no prayer and no God, why would the first official meeting of Congress open with a three-hour prayer? 1952, the Supreme Court case. Separate religious instruction from public education, because they were talking about doing that. This came up in the Supreme Court as early as 1952. And one of the justices responds, Separate religion instruction from public education? Inconceivable! That violates all of our history, all of our laws, all of our traditions, all of our precedents. We are not going to separate religious instruction from public education. The revisionists are casting a new vision, one without God, without the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The state of Mississippi. Now, this is, now this is after this, and this is what's happening now. So some of the states, this is an individual state, not, on the, on the, not at uh, the Supreme Court, but the federal courts at the state of Mississippi had a, a, a case over student-led prayer. And this is what the judge replied. The court will allow prayer if it is a typical non-denominational prayer. It can refer to God, it can refer to the Almighty, but it can't refer to Jesus prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's a direct violation of our First Amendment, flat out, telling you how you can pray. And what does everybody do? Some people boldly stand up, and they'll still bring Jesus in. Yeah! Come on, we've got to stand up. 1782, the first Bible printed in America, prayer was welcomed in school by the Supreme Court for 172 consecutive years. 172 years, prayer was welcome. The first Bible printed in English in America was printed by Congress, and written inside the cover is, this is a Bible printed for the use of schools. Today, the revisionists have twisted the original intent, not allowing the use of Bibles. Now, more recently, more recently, this just happened in the last 10 years. This is amazing. This blows my mind. But with postmodernism, where truth is subjective, your logic flies out the window. Listen to this. In a more recent Supreme Court case, Judge Souter was presented evidence from historian David Barton about how our founding fathers incorporated prayer into everything. The judge said, after he presented all of this history, he's the guy who, he did that book too. I think it's David Barton too. Is he the one that did Original Intent? Yeah, he did. He did the book Original Intent. Now, so here's the judges respond after he shows them all this historical evidence. We've seen here that the founding fathers participated in graduation prayer, condoned prayer, even advocated prayer. This just goes to prove that the founding fathers just didn't understand the Constitution. Come again? Is that kind of like saying you smoke pot but you didn't inhale? Is that, that's that same logic, isn't it? Excuse me here, Judge, you're telling me that you understand the Constitution better than the ones who, who wrote it. 
That's just what he said. The vote was five to four not to allow prayer in schools. All it took was, if one judge changed his mind, if one judge, it'd still be legal. One judge. One person. If you're a liberal judge that sees things through a subjective truth, things can be distorted. The intent of our founding forefathers is quite clear. So I'm just going to read this really quick. The first two sentences of the Declaration of Independence, opening statement, give reference to God. The top of the Capitol building, which houses the Supreme Court, Moses is holding the Ten Commandments. The two main doors to the Supreme Court are engraved with the Ten Commandments. The courtroom where the judges sit display the Ten Commandments. Hmm. But yet you can't have them in school. We got them in the highest court of the land. Bible verses are etched in stone all over the federal building and monuments in Washington, D.C. Here's a quote. We have staked the whole of our political institution upon the capacity of mankind for self-government upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments. All of this is based on the Ten Commandments. I mean, all of this and then all of the Constitution is based on the Ten Commandments that are in this book. Come on. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not by a, a, a religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Patrick Henry. 1977. Since 1977, Congress opens every, every session with a prayer by a minister whose salary is paid for by the federal government. One of Thomas Jefferson's greatest concerns was that the courts, the judicial system, the judges, would overstep their authority and instead of interpreting the law, would begin making law. The Supreme Court, the judges, are not to make laws. They are only to uphold the law and say if it's a legal law or not. That's it. But what they have done now is the Supreme Court actually is, is, is writing law to the point. They're, what they're giving in their um, understanding of what's happening now, they're actually putting things into law. Abortion and gay marriage, which came through the Supreme Court, should have been laws enacted by Congress, not something passed by our Supreme Court judges. And that was something that Thomas Jefferson was concerned about. 70% of the founding fathers were against slavery. Uh, but the media are now trying to portray, portray them as racists. Thomas Jefferson support, supposedly fathered children with slaves. Major headlines said DNA testing proved this fact. But this was proven wrong and the statement was retracted. But nobody reported on the retraction. Lies changing history. Thomas Jefferson Completed, uh, completely supported the use of the Bible to help shape our Constitution. He passed a law in Virginia. If you didn't go to church on Sunday, you received a fine. I wonder if we did that today. <laughs> but, you know, maybe the fine's a bad idea, but it proves the point. I'm not saying that we should fine everybody who doesn't go to church. I like the idea, but I don't think it'd work. No, um, it's, no it's just, it's not. You can't force people, right? But I said that, I put this here so you can understand he, this intent. Religion is deemed in other countries incompatible with good government and yet proved by our experience to be its best support, Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And it's sad that many of our politicians and some of our presidents in the last few years that have quoted this have left out by their creator. They're trying to remove God from our government. All 50 states, I told you this before, just this fact alone, every state has its own constitution. We have the federal constitution, you know, governing our whole country, then every state, when it became a state, had a constitution governing the state. And a preamble, a preamble is the, the introductory statement to the constitution. 
in the preamble to every state's constitution, which is one of the most important statements, your, your, your introduction, every one of them gives reference to God. Every one of the 50 states gives reference to God. That should tell us. I mean, there's so much proof. Can you see, does this, can you see this today, how we've been duped? How it's been twisted? When all the, 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 the facts and everything show us. Now, we're not saying that everybody, this is what's so great. Because we believe in the, in the foundations of, of biblical principles, that means everybody from around the world can come into America, whether you're Muslim or Hindu or Buddha, whatever, or atheist or agnostic or Wiccan, whatever. You can all come here and you can do what you do. But we can't change the basis of who we are or nobody will be able to do nothing. And the basis of who we are is based on Christianity. Without Christianity, we don't have freedoms. Without Christianity, the Constitution crumbles. Without Christianity, there's no more absolute truth. 